Is there anybody out there? Yes, we're almost starting now. So glad to have you there in the chat. That's great. Today, another installment in the letter of James. Welcome to BYOB, that's Bring Your Own Bible. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. It's just the name of the show. So I'm just so excited that you decided to join us today for another adventure through the letter of James. Before we begin though, if you are here for the first time, I really want to welcome you. This ministry is really for you. Uh, if you were not here, I would be just talking to myself. <laughs> So I'm glad uh, uh, that you, you decided to check us out. Please consider subscribing and sharing this material on your social media pages uh, so that more people can, uh, can be blessed by reading the scriptures together, right? Uh, also, I'd like to make an announcement. Uh, you know, we are almost uh, finished with the, with the letter of James. And if you have any ideas or where, uh, of which book to pick up next, you know, just let me know in the comments, leave a comment under this video, because really this, I, I am here to bless you. So, um, so I would like to hear from you guys. There are, there are various links under the video. Uh, so please check them out. There are various ways of staying in touch with Air Church throughout the week. There's a vibrant Discord server that you can be a part of. And also you can follow me on various social media pages as well. So please let me know where you would like to go next with these studies. And of course, I would like to know if you are being blessed by what we are doing here. So yes, it's just remember, it's all about you. Well, we're going to take a look at our letter of James in just a minute, just reminding you that all the slides are linked for your convenience also under this video in the video description. So you can anytime come back here and just uh, look at the passages that we're looking at. And uh, hopefully that will also make it easier for you to study the Bible together. The letter of James, guys. Before I begin, I usually open up in prayer. So let's pray together that people who hear this message will be blessed. Father God, you are so good to us. Thank you for this Bible. Thank you for your word, which is live, which is transforming lives. Father, I just pray that as we look at the letter of James today, that you would help us to, uh, to notice things that you want us to pay attention to. And as we do that, draw our attention to you and also transform us to be more like your son Jesus, because this is our desire to be more like him. We trust that you will do that. And if anyone here does not know you yet, Father, I just pray that they would reach out and they would find you. I pray all this in Jesus name. Amen. Well, everybody, <clears throat> this is exciting. The letter of James, just a bit of introduction. James, you know, he's a younger brother of our Lord Jesus, half brother, really, because he's from Joseph and Mary. He's not conceived of the Holy Spirit, of course. We know that James did not believe in Jesus during his earthly ministry. It was, un it was un after Jesus appeared to him, after he was crucified and resurrected, Jesus appeared to him and uh, it was then that James believed 
and became uh, um, one of the central figures in the church, in first century church in Jerusalem. And of course, thanks, you know, he's such a loving person. We can see that in this letter, right? The letter is written to encourage Jewish believers who are scattered throughout the area of, Ju of Jerusalem and beyond uh, because of persecution. And James is encouraging them. Um, and, and this letter is very relevant for us here today. You know, Christians have been persecuted for 2,000 years now, and it be, I believe that in the West we are going to be persecuted even more from now on. So I think it's really important for us to study these letters. James. James, James is amazing. Well, last time, if you remember, I'll just quickly recap, and if you haven't seen it, um, please check out the playlist, uh, and I, ho I hope this is going to be a great message for you. But last time, we looked at the idea of riches, money, right? People like to talk about money. Well, James talks about money and riches. And the, the, the overarching premise of last time's study was that Jesus paid a very steep price with his own life to set us free set us free from the desires of this world and to give us a new new destiny new uh, freedom liberty really and and that we have to consider that because wealth wealth or money or possessions or treasures in this world have this ability of trapping us enslaving us and they cause us to stop growing spiritually and we also, um, they, they make us ineffective when we, um, when we share Jesus with other people, right? So we need to understand that the money has this magnetic quality and it pulls us to this world. And we really don't belong to this world. We belong to heaven. We are citizens of heaven. So that's why money can be a trap, can be a trap. But, and we also realize that there's nothing wrong with money itself, because money is just a tool. So God is providing us with, with riches, with money, but the purpose of why he's doing it, so that we can practice to be generous people and loving people, okay? It is not there for us to accumulate money and gather as much as possible, but to use it wisely and be generous to others, just like God is generous towards us, right? So that's the important thing to re recognize about money. Money itself is not wrong, but our attitude towards money and how we try to collect it and we put our trust in it, that is the problem, because money cannot be trusted. So what we need to do is we need to ask, humbly ask God to transform our minds, to keep, just keep us reminded of who we are, that we are new creations in Christ, that we do not belong to this world. We are just here temporarily. And, uh, and basically God has to do, through his Holy Spirit, he needs to do this uh, work of liberating us from the slavery, from the chains that keep us attached to this world. Very good. But today we're going to take a little, a little trip together with James and we're going to take a step back and try to first of all answer the question where are we where are we guys okay where are we so we will look at we will look at uh, at the the timeline of scriptures and we'll try to figure out where we are in the God's plan of salvation okay because that will be relevant to today's topic that James is talking about so just like this child is looking around and wondering, where are we? We're going to do the same, guys. We're going to do the same as an introduction to this topic. So let's consider, let's go back. If we had a time machine, let's go back to Adam, to Adam himself, okay? And let's try to figure out how much Adam knew about God's plan. We know that Adam rebelled against God and he sinned, right? Uh, and obviously he experienced death and so on. But how much did Adam really know about God's plans? Well, we read in Genesis 3.15, God is giving a prophecy to Adam and Eve, actually, together. He says, and I will make enemies of you and the woman. He's talking about uh, the serpent who just tempted them, right? And caused them to sin. Well, I will make enemies of you and the woman, and of your offspring and her descendant. 
So there is there's going to be a war, war between the the seed of the woman, and there's going to be a war between Satan, right? Because we know that the serpent is a personification of Satan, the accuser. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Okay, so this is very enigmatic language. So this is how much Adam probably knew. Maybe he knew a little bit more. We know that when Eve had a child, she, uh, she called him Cain because she thought that he was the one, you know, she, uh, that God gave her the, the, the promised seed that would destroy Satan. So we, they knew that, uh, but of course she was wrong. She was wrong about the timing, okay? That's the point. She thought that Cain was the hope that God would give her, but unfortunately Cain turned out to be a murderer. Well, so let's consider Adam again. And how much did Adam know? Well, I think that he knew more or less what would happen. He knew more or less that Satan would be destroyed, okay? That the seed of a woman would eventually destroy Satan somehow, okay? But he didn't know how, okay? He didn't know how. Could he have imagined thousands of years of history? Could he have imagined that God would choose a nation Israel and that through that nation the seed of the woman would be born, right, of a virgin and so on? I don't think he, he would have known that, okay? Well, let's consider, let's go forward a little bit and um, consider Enoch. Now, Enoch is an interesting character in the Old Testament because he was a, a prophet. We don't know much about him, but we know that Jude in the New Testament is mentioning Enoch a little bit. So we have a little bit more information about what Enoch was doing uh, when he was uh, walking on this earth. Okay, and then with this interesting, what happened to Enoch is that he was taken away. He was as if raptured. God took him alive um, at the end of his ministry. Well, this is what Jude says concerning Enoch. It was also about these people that Enoch, in the, uh, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied. So we know that Enoch was a prophet, saying, Behold, the Lord has come with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and all of the harsh things which the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Very interesting. So what Jude is telling you in the New Testament is that in the, before even the calling of Abraham and so on, that back in Genesis, before the flood of Noah, um, uh, Enoch was preaching the second coming of Jesus. Think about that. When you read this description, Enoch's mission was to preach repentance and preach the coming of Jesus in advance, even before, even before the flood happened, right? So how much did Enoch know? Well, I think that Enoch knew the what. He knew that the, the promised one would come and that he would judge the nations, right? He knew more or less that it would happen. But did he know how it would happen? I don't think he knew. I don't think he knew that, okay? So even though Enoch was given words from God to speak, he didn't really know the full picture, okay? And that's the point I would like you to consider. Then consider Abraham, okay? Abraham is in a similar situation. This is what God says to Abraham after he had tested his faith with Isaac. He says, indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. Interesting words, right? And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. All the nations, okay? Because you have obeyed my voice. Okay, so how much did Abraham know? Well, obviously he knew that Isaac was the promised son, and through Isaac, the blessing would go forward, and that all the nations would be blessed. So he, has, he knew that much, right? So how much did he know? He knew that... He knew the what, the final outcome, sort of, he knew that. But do you think he could have imagined that there would be a prophet like Moses, that there would be, um, the law would be given, that there would be a temple and so on? Well, 
we don't know that, right? Even Abraham was in the dark about certain things. Well, then consider Jacob. Another one, okay? Consider Jacob. This is what we know about Jacob and the vision that God gave Jacob, okay? And he had a dream. Jacob had a dream or a vision. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Well, God gave Jacob a glimpse of a future condition where there would be a bridge set up between heaven, God, and the earth, the sinners, I guess, and that on that ladder there would be angels, or the word is messengers, right? Those who are sent with a particular, uh, particular uh, objective, God is sending them. They are ascending and descending on it. So what do you think? How much Jacob knew about the future? Well, he, again, he knew the outcome, okay? He knew that the what would happen. And what is the ladder that Jacob saw? Of course, it's a picture of Jesus Christ. He's our bridge. He is the man God in the flesh who's bridged, bridged God, the heavens, with the earth. And what are those angels? Who are those angels ascending and descending? Well, it's a beautiful picture of the church. You and I, guys, we are that, okay? We are part of that package that Jacob saw. But do you think he could have imagined how God would go about making it happen? Well, of course he didn't know. He didn't know. He only knew the, the final outcome, that humanity would be bridged uh, and have a connection, fellowship with God through the means of this ladder or or whatever, the staircase, okay? Beautiful stuff, okay? Now consider Moses. I just have one more example. One more example. This is what Moses was told. God told him this. He says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. Sorry, that's Moses is relaying what God told him. I'm from among you, from your countrymen, to him you shall listen. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them, to them everything that I command him. And it shall come about that whoever does not listen to my words, which he speaks, right, uh, is my name, okay, in my name, I myself will require of him. So again, what Moses knows something. There would be this amazing prophet like him, and this can be discussed at length. You know, what does it mean at him? He saw God face to face. He talked with God face to face. Uh, uh, miracles accompanied him things like that, right? So another prophet, a greater prophet than Moses would come and everyone would need to listen to him. Well, how much did Moses know? Well, probably he knew the what, right? God told him plainly that this would happen. But could he have known that this prophet would be born as a, as a carpenter's son in Galilee, in a place where people didn't really think was, you know, was very prestigious, that he would grow up in a in a humble uh, family. Um, did he know that the, this prophet would suffer the crucifixion? Probably he didn't know the how, okay? He didn't know the how. However, he knew the outcome, okay, guys? And this is my point now. Now consider yourself here and now in 2021. Fast forward, okay? 2,000 years after Jesus was crucified and, you know, and, how much do you know? How much do you know about God's plan? You know, we have the Bible and we tend to rely on it. And that's wonderful because that's the word of God. That's the revelation we have. And we know more or less the what. We are in the same situation as all these other great men of faith I just mentioned were. Okay. We know the what. But we still don't necessarily know how God is going to accomplish it. Okay. So that's my point for today, because James is going to address this point. So even though James lived and wrote this letter 2000 years ago, today we may know a little bit more, but we still don't know. God still has some things, some surprises uh, for us. And we need to show humility, an attitude of humility. And instead of arguing with, with others, we need to give God that liberty of 
of carrying out his plan the way he sees it fit okay so let's focus on what we know the what okay what do we know we read in philippians 2 we read the following words for this reason also god highly exalted him that's jesus and bestowed on him the name which is above every name wow okay so jesus is it it's all about jesus so we know that much so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven. So that would be the church, I guess. And on earth and under the earth. Wait a second. Even the dead, the dead as well. OK, isn't that interesting? And that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. OK, guys, this is the what this is what we know is going to happen. OK. How is God going to do it? Will every tongue willingly confess? Will they be forced to confess? Will they see the glory of Christ, repent and then worship Him? Will they, um, will they wake up from their graves just to realize that they made a mistake and be condemned? Well, see, we don't know how, but we know that it's going to happen. Okay, so we need to in humility understand our limitations and not argue about certain things not run ahead of god and argue about things that we have no idea about okay another one for example is uh, we hear from revelation 10 we see that when the seven there are some things guys we still don't know okay we tend to think about the bible as a complete package and it is god has given us a complete package for here and now but that doesn't mean that every single detail of God's plan is already revealed therein, okay? For example, in Revelation, John is given, is given a glimpse of what's going to happen, right? Amazing book to study, by the way. And he hears these thunders which are explaining things, unspeakable things, okay? So when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write down, right? He was, he was there for that purpose, to write down what he's hearing. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken and do not write them. So notice, God in his wisdom is allowing certain things to be unspoken yet, okay, in his word. There are yet chapters in God's plan of salvation ahead of us that we have no glimpse of yet. There may be hidden in scriptures, and this is, uh, you know, uh, it's the glory of the kings, uh, as, the, uh, as the psalmist says, to, 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 to dig out these treasures, and we should definitely do that. However, there are deliberate things that God chose not to reveal yet about his plan. So we know the what, we know that it's all about Jesus, and we know that it's glorious, that it's going to be amazing, but the how, is still foggy it's still misty and it, god in his wisdom allowed that that condition to continue even until today guys so that we wouldn't be too wise in our own eyes okay all right so where are we the question is where are we right in the timeline of god's plan well we know that we are living in a time that some people refer to as the church age the church age okay the church the church comes from that Greek word koinonia, which is, no, the ecclesia, sorry, koinonia is the fellowship, but ecclesia, which means the ones who have been called out, okay? We have been called out, out of this world, and God is collecting people from every nation to worship his son, Jesus, okay? He's collecting the bride for his son, that we are going to be united with him. We are already united with Christ through faith, but we are also are going to be actually united with him when we see him face to face. So the church age, guys. What is Paul saying about that? Okay, in Romans 11, he is talking about the future of Israel. Okay, Paul is talking about the uh, Romans 9 is the past, Israel's past. Romans 10 is Israel's present. And Romans 11 is still, Paul is talking about Israel's future yet. Okay, and this is what he says concerning this church age we are living in. 
He says, for I do not want you brothers and sisters to be uninformed of this mystery. By the way, mystery is a word that doesn't mean nobody knows what it is. Otherwise, Paul would not be saying that. In original Greek, the word mysterion is something that was hidden in the past. And now I am telling you about it. So it's no longer a secret. See, it's actually the opposite meaning of how we use the word mystery. For example, oh, I cannot find my watch uh, or my glasses. Oh, it's a mystery. Where'd they go to? See? But in Greek, it's opposite. Something that was not known in the past was revealed now, and it's no longer a secret. So Paul is revealing us this mystery. And that means the idea of the church was not specifically revealed in scriptures. Okay? That's what he's saying. So that you will not be wise in your own estimation, he says. Yeah? that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Okay, So what Paul is saying is that um, Israel has in part rejected their Messiah and that has ushered in a kind of a new era, a new direction where the good news of Jesus has gone to all the world, including the Jews who accepted him, but now to all the nations and until the fullness of the Gentiles. Okay, so that means there is a certain number in mind. God has a certain number in mind, which will con be considered the fullness of the Gentiles, guys. Until. And then, and so, all Israel will be saved. Okay? Just as it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. Okay? So he's still saying that, okay, well, this church age we're living in right now, it had a beginning and it also had a def it has a definite end. And God again is going to turn his eyes towards Israel to remove their ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them, God is saying, when I take away their sins. Remember, this is already written after Jesus was uh, crucified and resurrected. Okay, So he's not talking about something that already happened. It will happen in the future when Israel will actually turn to God. Okay. Very interesting. Very interesting. So we are living, you see, remember, uh, if you wanted to worship God under the Mosaic Covenant, you would have to be circumcised. You would have to follow all the laws. You would have to worship, sacrifice at the temple uh, with the Levites and so on. Right. And now, of course, we are living in the New Covenant. But in part, Israel has rejected it, at least for now. And we are living in this era where anyone, if you don't know Jesus today, you can just pray in the privacy of your own heart. Say, I want this for me, God. I've never heard this good news before. Thank you for Jesus dying for my sins. I deserve to die, and yet he died in my stead. And run to God because the doors are wide open. And, and the, the Father is waiting for you, okay? So we are living in such amazing times when we can share this good news with anyone and, and uh, it's up to them. If they believe it, they are included in the family of God. Amazing stuff, guys. So this little picture shows a very simplified version of, you know, eschatology as I understand it. Now, if you have, uh, if you don't agree with me, Again, I would just pray that you would um, uh, exercise grace and we don't need to agree on every single detail. But this little picture shows eschatology or the end times of how I understand it based on reading the Bible. Now, I could be wrong. And if I'm wrong, well, I'm willing to discuss these things. But, you know, the first arrow shows Jesus is coming down. OK, of course, Jesus came down to this earth. Uh, John 1, 1, for, you know, first there, he already existed as Logos, but then he took on flesh, uh, John 1, 14, and he tabernacled among us. He lived among us. And then the next element on this picture is the cross, of course. The, his m whole mission of, of coming the first time around was to die on the cross, to become a sacrifice for our sins. Okay, and then that line that shows that is a little little curved one and a long one that is the church age guys that we are living in okay 
Now, where are we on that timeline? Well, I believe that we're close to the end of the church age. Okay, it has lasted for 2000 years. But again, I could be wrong. Who knows? All right. But I believe that there are certain signs pointing to the fact that we are close to the end of this church age. Okay, the next thing is the arrow pointing upwards. And this is something, this is an idea taught in scriptures. It's called the rapture, okay? The rapture of the church or, or, the, or the, the plucking away or the actual word, the Greek words that, uh, that explains it is, is called harpazo, if you want to look it up. Uh, the word rapture is not in the Bible, but that's the Latin variant of the same word, which is harpazo. And it's an event just like Enoch. Remember, I already mentioned Enoch who was taken up in an instant. In, a, in an instant, he was taken up to heaven. The believers who live at that time, they will be taken up, taken up and be with Jesus, right? So Jesus is going to meet us if we live until that time. And if not, we will be resurrected at that time and we will meet him in in the clouds okay so jesus is going to almost come back but he's not going to come back to rule just yet he's coming to get us okay to get us home so that would be the rapture the next little line there little you know squiggly line that is you know there will be some hard times and there will be this time called some people refer to it the great tribulation where you know israel will be in trouble okay they will be really in trouble because the whole world will be against them and and it is at that time that Israel is going to search the scriptures and they will be so humbled that they will realize, oh no, we missed our Messiah. And it is then that on a national level, Israel is going to petition God to, uh, to save them. And, and it's, it, this is when Jesus is coming back to establish his millennial reign on earth. Uh, together with us then okay so this is how I understand eschatology in a nutshell and it's there is a reason why this picture is not very detailed because I do not want to run ahead of what God has revealed in his scriptures and of course even on that my current understanding may be flawed and uh, I am willing to be open if you if you want to uh, disagree with me and so on however the the fact that I wanted to point out for the purpose of today's study is that we are living in this church age, right? Until the fullness of Gentiles comes in. And then God is going to switch gears and do something else that is still, of course, part of his plan of salvation. So what are we supposed to do while we wait, guys? While we wait for Jesus to return? Are we just supposed to sit around? This is the point that James is going to address today in his study, okay, in, in, in this section. While we wait, what do we do, okay? Do we just pray and hope that Jesus comes back soon? Well, this is where James comes in. James 5, starting today with verse 7, he says, Therefore, he says, therefore, going, going back to the idea that uh, we are in the last days, he mentioned just before that. He says, therefore, be patient, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. All right. So James, with love, he is telling his brothers and sisters, he's telling you and me to be patient. OK, we need to be patient, patient until the coming of the Lord. OK, until the coming of the Lord. So it seems that James is clearly saying that God's clock is ticking. Nothing can stop it. Just like in the thumbnail of this video, you saw a little hourglass, the sand, the grains of sand are falling and they are not going back, okay? Every second that goes by leads us closer and closer to Jesus' return, okay? So God's clock is ticking. We don't know what time it is on God's clock, but we know that it's moving forward. That's why we need to be patient. Well, it's God's clock, right? It's God's clock and, well, we need to show that we respect God, our Creator, for His timing, not our timing. Maybe some of us would like to be out of here um, sooner rather than later, but in God's wisdom, we are still here and we are on His timing. Well, be patient. This is not something that you tell a kid, you know, be patient. 
and the kid says yeah but i don't want to be patient okay i want my toy now give me my toy now well this patience has a reason okay it's not a matter of if jesus returns so we don't have to worry about that he will return but of it's a question of when right that's the only issue that's remaining he is coming back and that is a certain thing okay we don't have to guess that whereas when you tell a kid that he has to he or she has to wait for his or her toy well they might in their mind says oh my parent is trying to cheat me out of it cheat me out of my blessing no 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 uh, it's not a question of if you're going to get your toy, but it's just a question of when. So it's reasonable patience. It's reasonable. Okay, There is a reason behind it. And I guess we are not with Jesus yet because we, I guess maybe God is interested in growing his church. Right? We'll, I'll show you some other reasons why guys, God is still waiting. But it's reasonable patience. We can agree at least mentally with God. Okay, God has his purposes and he's, he would rather have us wait at this time. And it's very clear that we are in the last days. Okay, I will bring in some passages to show you this. We are in the last days. So now, especially now, it would be prudent to be patient. Okay, God has waited this long in history. Uh, for some reasons, he had his own reasons, and now he's still waiting just a little bit longer. Okay, that's the idea that I would like you to get out of this text. In 2 Peter 3, this is what we read. We read the prophecy, okay? We read the prophecy that should comfort us. This is what Peter says. Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue just as they were from the beginning of creation. This kind of shows the attitude of uh, some mainstream churches throughout history. Okay? What happened was that early on, maybe 2nd, 3rd century, uh, church kind of re realized that, well, Jesus is not coming back. So they tried to look at scriptures and try to reinterpret it as if, okay well jesus is not coming back so i guess the church now jesus came back already in the church okay so the church has this role of governing the world okay just like jesus uh jesus uh, you know we know that jesus is going to rule this world justly uh, some church leaders decided that you know what since he's not coming back, I guess he left it up to us to rule this world. And of course, we know that from church history, that didn't turn out so well, okay? Uh, church and politics shouldn't really mix. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So we just need to exercise patience. Because if we get into ruling, you know, we, we will just mess it up, okay? But when Jesus returns, he will just uh, he will uh, rule justly. So we see we see from Peter that there there would be these people, and we can see in history that's exactly what happened. And I think it is even more so true today. Okay, people think, oh yeah, Jesus returns. Okay, scoffers abound. Okay, they're right and left. They're everywhere, guys. This is exactly what the Bible is saying would happen. So while we wait, we need to be patient. And why do we need to be patient? Well, we are children of God, right? So we should uh, exhibit similar qualities uh, that our Father has. And one of those qualities is patience. God is incredibly patient with you and I. Okay, God is very patient with us. We need to be patient because God is patient. The same letter of Peter says, the Lord is not, God has his own reasons, right? For being patient. He says, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So notice, God is delaying his next stage of, the, of his plan of salvation because I guess he's over. He 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 wishes for all those who have a chance to hear the gospel to come to a repentance, and for the, for all of us who are already in Christ, God would also want us to come to a spiritual maturity, so that when we see Jesus face to face, 
we would be able to enjoy him more, to appreciate him more, okay? So I think God has his own reasons of why he's delaying. Uh, but it is not a delay of an unexpected delay. We also under, we need to understand that God is omniscient. So it's not a surprise to him that he's delaying. God had it already in his mind to do that. And it's good for us to expect his coming. It's good for us to think that he may be coming any minute now. Okay. Going back to James, he says, therefore, be patient brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. We read this part already, and now he's, he's, uh, he's going to support his point with, an, uh, with a picture. And James would know this. Growing up in Galilee, he would know farming, right? James would know farming. He says, the farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the, er the early and late rains. Okay, so he is actually giving some specific details from farming. I'm not even familiar with this. I guess there were maybe uh, rainy seasons in Israel and there were a couple of harvests. I'm not really sure about these details, but he's, he's bringing up this idea of a, of a farmer. And I think we can just extrapolate from this and focus on a farmer. Okay, let's consider what being a farmer is like. Maybe we can learn something about our attitude by looking at the daily tasks of a farmer. So what about farmers? Maybe you know farming. I would like to hear from you guys. In some, you know, in Asia, uh, the rice is grown. In other parts, the wheat, wheat you know, some people uh, grow corn uh, or even soy, soy nowadays, right? But there are some commonalities between farmers, okay? We know that farmers are proactive. You see, farmer, when a farmer gets up, they get up early in the morning, usually. They get up early in the morning and they know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. They know the season and they know, oh, it's time to plow. Okay, and the sooner I plow my field, well, the sooner I'll be done and I can go, go on, move to on other things. So farmers are not sitting there waiting for others to tell them what to do. Okay, they know exactly what they need to be doing. Isn't that a lesson for us, guys? Preach the gospel, okay? What are you doing? Are you waiting for somebody to tell you where, where to get involved? Well, it's up to you to figure out, okay? Pray to God and pray for opportunities for sharing the gospel. Like, I feel so blessed that, you know, with this channel, I can do this, right? And I, I, have, no, I have no control over who's going to come in, wander in here and listen to this, but I leave that up to God. Right? That's another point about farmers. They are hardworking. Okay? So they, we already know that. I guess we should be too. I am not guilt tripping anybody, by the way, because that is not how we gain favor with God. We don't gain favor with God by, uh, let me do more for you, God, and then you will accept me. No. Jesus died for our sins and we are fully accepted in Christ. We could not do, uh, we could we could just do nothing for the rest of our lives and God would love us just the same, okay? We relate on, based on grace, so I'm not saying that. But farmers are hardworking because they want to succeed. They want, they're looking forward to, to the harvest, right? Farmers are also adaptable. So, you know, when the, the season is dry, maybe farmer may decide, well, maybe I'll switch crops. I'm going to uh, sow something else. Or maybe they need to, you know, there are some, um, something is destroying the crops. Well, I have to take measures to do that, right? So they're watching over what's happening and they adapt to the situation. I think we should do the same, you know, like we are in the situation now where many churches are shut down. Some buildings are not open. Well, then we need to prayerfully consider other ways of reaching people and doing our ministries, right? That's what a farmer would have done. Okay, and also farmers are dependent on many external factors, such as the weather. Uh, you know, the birds come, the locusts come and they eat the crop. You know, there are some things that the farmer is not in charge of. And that's okay. The farmer knows that. And I think we also need to realize that, okay? We don't know. Um, we are dependent on God, ultimately, to make whatever we plant grow, okay? And sure, I think a farmer is a humble 
a worker who knows that their crop will be largely dependent on many external factors so they may pray for good weather they may trust god that god will take care of it they trust in the system that god set up that whatever they will do will is going to yield a return a profit in the end right I think we need to learn from that as well. Depend on Christ, depend on God as you are doing your ministry, but continue doing your ministry. Okay, that's the point. Well, and of course, everything that the farmer does, they don't get any benefit from it until harvest time. Think about it. All their hard work, getting up in the morning, plowing the field, uh, you know, sowing, uh, watering the irrigation pipes whatever they're doing you know they're they're oiling their machines they're buying the, the equipment they're spending all this money on fertilizer everything they don't get any benefit from it if if an alien was looking at this situation from space and said well these people are stupid what is he doing he's spending so much time on this field because they're harvest oriented guys it's all about the harvest right and isn't it the case with us as well? Yes, let's focus on that. So I think, yes, the example of a farmer is very fitting because to be a farmer, you need to be patient. We have a lot to learn from farmers. Yes, in Galatians 6, 9, Paul says the following. He says, let's not become discouraged in doing good, right? You may feel tired of always doing the same thing. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I prepare lessons and I just never hear from, from people. Is it blessing them or not? But I need to consider the fact that, you know, it takes time to grow something and that, uh, that God is going to bless it in the end. You know, there will be a time when there will be a harvest and I can be encouraged by that. He says, for in due time, we will reap. We will reap, okay, if we do not become weary. And imagine if a farmer suddenly decided, well, I've been plowing this field every day now for two weeks and um, yeah, you know what, I'll just give up now. Well, they're not going to reap, okay? They might reap something that sowed itself accidentally, but not the crop that they were meant to sow on the field. Right, so the harvest is worth it, guys. The harvest is worth it and we too need to be harvest oriented. Imagine all the nations, just imagine in heaven, people from various nations and tongues praising God together, right? Isn't it amazing? Sometimes when you go to an international church or you have fellowship with people online from various countries, it's like a little taste of heaven, guys. Just imagine. And maybe you are going to be there because somebody shared Jesus with you. You didn't know Christ, but somebody shared the good news. and. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. And now you are included in the family of God. The harvest is worth it, guys. Let's go back to James. He says, you too, be patient, just like that farmer. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. What does it mean, the strengthening of the heart? Okay, so while we wait, we can engage in something called strengthening our heart. Well, there are, even in the farmer's life, you know, there are days when there's nothing to do because the field is plowed, the seed is sown, and now we're waiting for the rain, okay? Well, so when you're in that situation, that's fine. Well, then you can strengthen your heart, okay? What does that mean? Psalm 55, verse 22, we read, Cast your burden upon the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. So this, um, this, what, what this is the the strengthening of the heart is not allowing the seeds of doubt, the seeds of discouragement to grow in your heart. Okay, so we need to weed our hearts, and we need to make sure that we are casting all our cares, all our burdens on God, and we can. We have a, you know, so that means like having a close connection with God. Um, a similar thought is expressed also in Peter. Peter is a great guy, guys. Uh, maybe we should do his letter next. He says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you at the proper time. He says, having cast all your anxiety on him because he cares about you. 
All right. So uh, uh, one aspect of strengthening your heart is, is knowing that God cares about you. So yes, we are waiting. These people that James was writing to were persecuted. Their possessions were being taken away from them. They were uh, chased out of their synagogues. They were put out of the community. Well, but God cares about you. And if God is for you, who can be against you, right? So we can cast all our anxiety, whatever is you're facing today, you can just cast that off and say, God, I could worry about this, but I choose not to. I, I'll have you worry about it. You'll figure it out. I know that you care about me and you are able to deal with this. Okay. So that's what strengthening of the heart is. Strengthen your hearts. It has to be grounded in truth. Of course, the truth is that God loves you. You are precious in his sight. Okay. God has paid the ultimate price. He has gone out of his way to redeem you from death, to give you new life, new identity, new destiny. So this short time on this earth, while you're waiting, is also part of his mercy. There must be a reason why you're here, okay? And even though you may not understand it right now, someday you will look back and say, wow, and now I get it. I needed to be there in that difficult situation. So grounded in truth. Well, and you need to recognize that, you know, it takes some commitment. Um, you know, when Jesus was, uh, you know, he was feeding the hungry and suddenly he had this huge following of people who just wanted free bread. Okay, they, uh, they admitted, Lisa said to him, well, just, you know, uh, Moses fed us this manna from heaven. Why don't you feed us some more bread? Jesus will follow you. Okay, and then Jesus switched his ministry into more, a uh, little bit different. Uh, you know, he started speaking in parables and he said that you need to really eat my body which he meant you must believe in me and that's how you live forever okay so and then you know he, he suddenly his his following started to shrink okay so judas his uh, marketing manager says what are you doing jesus you're losing followers now we're losing well well jesus said to to the 12 says, so how about how about you do you also want to leave me now and Peter stands up and he says, no, where, where shall we go? Lord, you have the words of life. Where else are we going to go? So recognize your commitment. What are you going to do? You're going to live your life after have, having tasted the, the goodness of God in your life, the grace that transforms you? Or are you going to, to quit halfway, halfway through? Of course not. So recognize that your commitment makes sense. Stick with it, right? Don't give up. Uh, you know, but it's okay to admit dependence, right? The ad admit dependence on God. It's not your, you're not meant to do it all by yourself. God is giving you his Holy Spirit. He's giving you a community of believers that you are within, you know, you're supposed to fellowship with, build each other up. Uh, he's given gifts to these people to build you up. He's given you some gifts to build others, uh, others up in their faith. So depend on God to, to, get, to carry you through these difficult times. And one thing that you must never, never do is turn back. And what I mean by that is live in some kind of regret. Um, live in the past and dwell on your mistakes, things like that. Okay, this is not helpful. We all make mistakes, okay, and we should learn from our mistakes. And we do. Mistakes are painful and they are a very good teacher, right? But you might be tempted to turn back and actually focus on those past mistakes. And that is a serious problem because it will stop. It will, it will stunt your spiritual growth. You need to look forward. Look at Jesus and move forward. This is what Jesus said in Luke, Luke 9. He said the following. Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let's go back to this analogy of a farmer. You know the plow, right? The plow is this tool that turns the earth ground and softens the ground so that the seed can take root and so on. Well, you plow. How do you plow? You plow forward, right? You don't plow backwards. So, OK, fine. So let's say you're plowing and, and then your plow is not. Maybe it's in the wrong place. Maybe you're the lines that you're making are not straight. What, are you going to turn back now? That's, and look at your mistakes? 
No, look forward, learn from your mistakes, but you look forward, you don't look back, right? So this is what Jesus is talking about. Well, this may sound like harsh words, guys. It may sound like harsh words because we all tend to do that. We, oh, no, I am no good. Oh, how can God accept me now? I screwed up again. I promised him I would never sin again like this. And well, when we make such promises, uh, we actually set up ourselves for a failure. But so we should never do that. But on the other hand, you know, we are tempted to look back. But it's okay, guys, because you already qualified. If you are in the kingdom, if you are in the kingdom of God, you already qualify. God ch chose you. He, remember, you belong to the called out ones. You are the part of the church. You qualify. So just take, take heed to what Jesus said and just be reminded. Okay, I'm not supposed to be looking back. I, why should I live with regrets? Give that to God, okay? What you're supposed to be focusing now is moving forward right and and keep christ your goal all right so strengthening your heart is an important thing while we wait for jesus to come back right next verse he says you too be patient strengthen your hearts for the coming of the lord is near so now i want to focus on the last phrase the coming of the lord is near near all right well these words were written two thousand years ago you might say okay well so what we are reading them now and they are there for you now the bible is current book it's not a it, it has history in it but it's alive now okay so just imagine the coming of the lord is imminent imminent means there is nothing precluding there's nothing else that needs to happen in history for him to take us out of here it could happen any second okay so that's what imminent means. Imminent means that it can happen at any time. We need to be ready. Uh, and if it was near, if, if, if God chose to say through James that the coming of the Lord is near 2000 years ago, then how near is it now? It's even nearer now. Okay. So that's what I'd like you to, to focus on. Okay. Just because it was in the Bible for the last 2000 years, and uh, it doesn't mean that because what matters is that you have the Holy Spirit in you now in 2021 as we speak and you are reading these words now and this is what it means the coming of the Lord is near okay and this the, the Bible speaks to us here and now all right verse 9 James says do not complain next thing okay he's moving on to another thing do not complain brothers and sisters against one another so that you may not be judged Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Okay, it's a little bit puzzling here. Okay, do not complain, brothers and sisters. Complaining is kind of, you know, there is an implication made that the things are not the way they should be. Right? When you complain about something, you are actually saying the things are not the way they should be. Wait a second. Are you becoming a judge now? Are you judging God? Because he, had, he has placed you in this geographic location, in this time in history, for a particular purpose. He has surrounded you with these people. Some of them annoy you. Some of these people are nice and kind. Some are not so nice. And are you, say, are you going to complain now? Are you going to say to God, well, you didn't know what you were doing? See what I'm saying? So when we complain, we make our elevate ourselves above god and we judge the situation saying you screwed up god you put me in a situation that shouldn't be okay so do not complain while we wait okay while we wait for jesus that's another suggestion do not complain so stop complaining and quit whining okay whining right negativity that just kills the spirit you know we're supposed to be joyful and uh, even paul writing uh, from uh, from the jail to philippians he was facing execution and yet he says rejoice in the lord always right so this whining just spreads like a disease to others and and people think like oh this is so this is so good we're we're so close now together because he's whining and i'm whining so we're kind of like we have this kindred spirit no 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 that is not 
uh, th that is not what Christian bo loving body of Christ should be doing because you are in good hands okay so whatever you're going through is filtered through loving hands of your heavenly father okay that's it may not seem like it you might say oh you've you don't understand my situation well i don't and i don't pretend to understand your situation but if you were just to remove yourself from the situation and looked at your look at your situation from god's point of view you might begin to notice that you are actually in good hands god is able to take care of you no matter what it is okay so maybe you are just constructing this false sense of reality in your mind and and that is the source of your complaining maybe from god's point of view you're not so you're not so bad your, your situation is not so bad right you're in good hands remember that so and then he says stop complaining against one another okay so obviously these people were arguing they were quarreling and they were arguing against one another so it's a one thing to complain against god but another one to uh, uh, complain against brother or sister in the lord so and then he says these strong words behold the judge is here okay so again the situation is that we are uh you know we are at this end of the church age the G jesus is already here at the door he's almost knocking on the door to get you home okay so in the light of no in the light of this fact why are you arguing with a brother or sister okay why are you complaining to one another and the bigger point here is that you know the judge is here at the door and he has already accepted you too even you okay <laughs> even you with all your faults with all your problems with your with your annoying attitude your negativity the judge is here and he has already accepted you into his family so how can you now turn around and and complain against your brother and sister who's also accepted okay they are also they are also accepted just as you are <laughs> okay guys so i think that's a healthy perspective to be having okay the judge is here and he has accepted you already okay he finds no fault in you because you trusted in jesus just like he finds no fault in the other one so why are you complaining Remember last time we talked about we do not relate to our brothers and sisters on the level of the flesh because that's not what they are. It's not who they are. They are already new creations in Christ and that's how we should relate to one another. All right, so stop complaining. Stop complaining, James says. Verse 10, he says, as an example, brothers and sisters, of suffering and patience, he says, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. And we're going to go through a list of prophets. And then he gives the most extreme example in verse 11. He says, We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings. You know, he's talking about Job uh, being blessed in the end, even though Job went through some ordeals. But he was blessed in the end. That is the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful okay so that is the objective truth yes you may be going through suffering and trials but those who endure are blessed in the end because god is full of compassion and is merciful so that is the objective truth well but let's take a look at these prophets that he mentions and i'll just highlight a few you know you might be surprised abel is is abel a prophet well he's not a prophet in the full sense of the word abel is not and yet he speaks prophetically he is he points us to jesus okay abel and his sacrifice the fact that he the, the way he sacrificed the animal and then that he himself became an innocent sacrifice okay cain killed his brother his blood his innocent blood speaks uh, prophetically about Jesus well well it was hard I'm sure it didn't feel good when his brother killed him okay sure and yet he endured and yet now we read about Abel and we see and we can learn from Abel's faith he's a blessing to us all then let's think about Joseph well Joseph in the Old Testament Joseph I mean he um, 
he he suffered so much right he prophetically speaks of jesus because of his suffering uh wow i would like to do a study on joseph uh, one day we did that actually in, in the in the book of hebrews so play check out the playlist for hebrews because it's a very interesting study joseph joseph really points to jesus prophetically okay and yet he endured until the end wasn't he a blessing yes he was a blessing not only to egypt which was the entire world, known world at the time, and, but also to his own family. He saved his own family from death, which again speaks prophetically of Jesus being the savior of the world and of Israel as well. Well, what about Isaiah? Well, we know that uh, we have indications in scriptures and from uh, oral tradition that Isaiah was, uh, was sown in two. Okay? He died a martyr's death. That's another prophet. We know that uh, he, was, um, he was also persecuted for the words that he spoke, and yet he endured until the end. Well, what about Jeremiah, the weeping prophet? Well, you know, when he was um, uh, bound himself with a prostitute as a sign, not a prostitute, but a wife that was unfaithful, as a picture showing that Israel was not being faithful to the Lord and so on. He was the weeping prophet, right? Well, they, those guys didn't have it easy, right? And yet, they persevered, they endured. What about Daniel himself? I mean, I mean, he was persecuted for praying um, to God when it was forbidden. Um, he was thrown into a lion's den. He faced lions, and right. So things were uh, things were not easy, and yet he he persevered. Was he blessed? Yes, he was. He was blessed. In the end um, well what about job as well well we kind of touched on job as well and by the way if you want to study job on YouTube there's a great video inspiring philosophy Mike Jones has a great video on the book of job probably the best analysis I've seen on that book I highly recommend it well do you think if we had a time machine and if we could or we could actually call up these guys now and we could ask them do you think your suffering on this earth was worth it? Do you regret anything? Do you regret that you didn't give up then? I am willing to bet that every single one of them would now say it was absolutely worth it. Okay, they would say, actually, when I think about the glory of God beholding him face to face, I think my suffering on this planet while I was on, on, on earth was peanuts. It was nothing. It's silly. It's not even worth mentioning. That's what I think they would have said. James continues, but above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear. Okay, you might think it's swear like using bad words. No, he's not saying that at all. He's talking about making oaths here, making oaths or promises. He says, either by heaven or by earth. Uh, it's like, a, maybe it's not so common in our, in our culture nowadays, but those days it was, you know, in order to make an official oath, they would invoke a God's name or it would, they would invoke something holy. Um, but he says, don't do that or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you do not fall under judgment. Again, uh, let me unpack it a little bit, because this culturally may be a little bit foreign to us. What does he mean by... It's, it has to do with the way we use our language, our speech, okay? And of course, we know that we use our language to manipulate others, right? <laughs> that's what language is. That's how children learn, you know? They, they learn that if they scream, that means the parent is going to come around and give them whatever they want. And that's how we grow up and we, uh, in, we kind of expand our sphere of influence with our language. Some people grow up to be, be lawyers and that's what they do. Uh, they get paid for doing that. They use language to manipulate others. Some people become politicians, but, <laughs> and they do the same. And James here says, no, you shall not use language, speech, uh, to, uh, towards an unfair advantage. Okay, let's unpack this. Talk straight, basically. So we could maybe give this section a heading. You are meant to talk straight to people. You know, sometimes 
you have a discussion with someone and you ask them a question and then they cannot they don't they are not willing to answer yes or no instead they will try to answer with a question or they will just twist it around or they will say are you so are you saying this or that and that's what james is getting at don't be like that just say yes or say no if you mean it if you mean it say what you mean talk straight okay so you know when you tell a story do not embellish facts people begin they try to uh, they, in order to grab attention people say like you won't believe what happened to me the other day well if you i won't believe what happened are you why are you saying this like did it really happen or not if it happened just tell me what happened you don't need to exaggerate just tell me what happened <laughs> Because if you need to use such devices, if you need to exaggerate, make it, make it a, a story that is, uh, you know, like, like we read in the hadiths, you know, that uh, inc incredible stories that, uh, that were happening and stuff like that. Well, do not embellish that. Just say yes or no. Because if you need to do that, that means, you know, maybe your character is not trustworthy, right? If you need to do that. Speak truthfully. Okay, so on you know phrase you know even phrases like honestly, honestly I would prefer to well what do you mean honestly? Uh, if you don't use that word honestly, you were not honest with me, you know, just just talk straight, talk straight, and also do not manipulate others with language. You know I promise I'll do this. Okay, I'll promise I'll, or or or. Uh, I swear to God, I swear to God, this, you know, that's, that's nonsense, guys. Don't do that. Don't use God's name for such purposes, okay? If you mean to do something, do it. If you don't mean to do something, say no and explain why you're not going to do it, okay? You don't need to do any, anything else other than that. Because, well, listen, we can't, you know, how can you promise that tomorrow you're going to do such and such and such? You don't even know if you're going to wake up tomorrow, okay? Maybe you're going to be with the Lord by tomorrow. Who knows? We're not in charge of the future. And that's the implication here, that when you make an oath, when you make an oath, you are implying that you are in control of your future. And you are making statements that, uh, that are, you know, are contingent on the future going your way. You can't do that. You're not God. Okay, so let's not do that. Let's just say yes or no. And, and, and just be done with it. I think it's easier to live this way, guys. It's easier, definitely. And it's very refreshing, very refreshing to talk to people who say what they mean, okay? And they don't try to manipulate others with their language. Do not swear to God, okay? Uh, and that was, again, a very a cultural thing of that day, in invoking the name of God uh, in order to make an oath or, you know, just say yes. It, this is what happened or no that did not happen or this is what i'm going to do or no i'm not going to do it plain yes or no will do well guys uh in ephesians 4 uh, we read the following as a result we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of people by craftiness in deceitful scheming okay so so this is the idea. We are not to try to trap people. Uh, well, this is what sometimes happens when you talk to people who are, you know, represent different cults or false religions. They will try to use language to entrap you. Okay. They, um, and this is again what Paul here is talking against. Okay. He's speaking against that. Don't see our message. There is no trickery in that. Jesus lived sinless life he died he was risen he is risen he is I, I, he is the lord of all okay our message there's no trickery there right we just speak the truth god when i trusted god he came into my life he transformed my life he gave me hope this is my testimony this is what i am speaking i don't need to uh wordsmith my speech i don't need to uh, think about my words so carefully as to oh no let's entrap my listener into some kind of uh, you know doctrine I hope he doesn't realize that I embellished some facts here no it's nonsense guys 
So, we are not here to be carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of people, by craftiness in deceitful scheming, okay? This is the antithesis of our Christian message, of the good news. Deceitful scheming, right? Now, some deities in the Middle East, uh, Allah is one of them, he prides himself on being the best of the deceivers, okay? So, that kind of tells you uh, that... Uh, this is the very antithesis of that particular philosophy, ideology, I should say. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ. So it seems that it is in God's interest to leave us like this for, I guess, I, I guess for the time being, while we are struggling and we'll figure out these, we are figuring these things out and that we are you know actively living in dependence on god to help us and to transform us from within um and i guess james at the at the end of this particular section he he closes with with that particular issue of using language because you know language is logos logos the word the word right if um, if we are children of God, then our words need to be, we need to reflect the source that, that, that they're coming from. Uh, Jesus is truth. He is truth. He is life. Therefore, let us speak the words of truth and let us speak the words of life. No trickery, no pretending, no making oaths that we cannot, promises that we cannot keep, okay, just to put the other person at ease. No. Just say yes or no. So what's the takeaway from today's study? Well, we see that we are in a time of waiting. We are waiting for Jesus to take us home. Okay, That's, That has been established. But this waiting doesn't mean uh, that you need to kill time. Okay, You are not there to sit there passively and just wait for the Lord to show up. We have tasks and things to do. And the best thing that you can do is actually focus on Jesus and focus on the matters of the kingdom, right? Because that is a form of worship. That's how we worship God, right? We have been given the Great Commission. So, unfortunately, during uh, church history, uh, this paradigm, the church paradigm, has been flipped upside down. There was a person who was put on top. You know, they call that person a minister, and the minister is ministering to the laity, to those people who are the churchgoers, and that's the way many people see church. That is not the case at all. Okay, flip that upside down. And actually, if you are in Christ today, you are a minister. Okay, it is the job of your pastor or, or, or the one, the person who you call the minister to equip you give you, uh, you know, provide you with the necessary tools, with the necessary skills the, and encouragement and prayer so that you can do your ministry. You are a minister, okay? So focusing on Jesus and the kingdom of God is a form of worship. That's what we were supposed to be doing, right? Not just uh, sit in the pew once a week on Sunday and be ministered to. We are to minister. We have our own ministries. Well, and we also learned today that the Lord's return is imminent. There is nothing precluding that event from happening. It could happen any minute now, okay? And if it happened, that would be great. But if it doesn't happen, that's still okay, because we're waiting, but not waiting passively. So knowing that the Lord's return is imminent should motivate us. That would be a, a proper motivation, right, for us to act not just make, you know, use empty words like these crafty uh, cult members, right, that come knock on your door and they try to trap you into some, some doctrine or something like that. No, we don't need to do that. We are, we know that Jesus is about to return and that spurs us into action and loving action towards those God puts us in touch with. And Yes, things may be hard. There's no denying. James is not denying that. But this temporary hardship pales in comparison to the glory that awaits us, that is going to be revealed in us. Actually, the whole creation is waiting for that. Okay? The creation is groaning, awaiting the, re the revelation, the revealing of the sons of God. Okay? That means you and I. 
um yeah this is really really um, amazing stuff guys so james is encouraging his audience like this i think this message is so relevant to us today especially as we consider this time drawing near okay jesus, jesus could really return any any minute well before we part i'd like to ask you some reflective questions so i hope you can reflect with me together well what does this passage teach us about god well i would like to hear from you maybe in com in the comments if you would like to leave uh, what you're getting uh, from these messages that would be awesome uh, for me you know the grace of god is just dripping from these pages okay because he's he's already accepted us and we are victors in christ okay and yet uh, and, and you know even though we don't we sometimes just wait around we don't use our time wisely just like this man in the in the video i was showing throughout this message you know we just um, we just sometimes waste a day after another day and so on and yet jesus is try, you know he's he's coming soon and we need to be oriented towards the harvest guys the harvest just like a farmer so i just think that god is so gracious to us that he's just allowing us to waste a day after day until we learn these lessons and we are then willing to do it willingly okay um grow up and and eventually get it okay so i think he's a very patient father with us that's what i'm getting from this message today well, if this is true, what does it mean for me? Well, maybe this means that you can consider the farmer again, the farmer lifestyle, and apply it to your ministry um, of growing in Christ, right? And bringing others to Christ. Well, I hope that whatever you decide to do, that these will be practical steps, that you go in prayer to God and say, God, show me how I can use my time more wisely. Maybe I'm complaining, complaining a lot. Maybe when I am with my brothers and sisters in the Lord, maybe it's I bring everybody down. Well, help me not to do that. Okay, so whatever your case is, I just hope that you are praying about it and also that you are sharing what God is doing in your life. Because that's how we are meant to function as the body of Christ, right? It is so organic. You are a blessing to somebody else when you share what God is doing and they are a blessing to you when they do the same. Well, everyone, thank you so much for, um, for spending time with us until the very end. If you're watching this uh, until the very end, that's awesome. Before we part, let's just thank God in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for, the, for these encouraging words that James has for us. Father, sometimes we don't use our time on this earth uh, very productively. We don't look to you. Uh, we complain a lot. We grumble. We, and yet, you have accepted us like this, you know, blanketed us with grace. Father, so remind us of these things so that we may extend that grace to others around us and be more, as a result of that, be more like your son Jesus. And if there is, should there be anyone here who does not know you yet and in intimately in their heart, Father, I just pray that they would reach out to you and that you would be found. You would come into their lives and begin the transformative work uh, that you long to do in each one of us. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Um, remember, James uh, is coming to an end. I would like to hear from you regarding the direction that we should take from now on i am willing to do anything but i'd like to hear from you guys and i will also pray about it see you next time just uh, hit that bell icon so that you are notified of future streams as i tend to restream it throughout the week at a different time for audiences in different parts of the world stay blessed and see you next time